Yes, this is good. We're just waiting. Okay, for the guys to sit down. Um, yeah, ac actually, why don't, there are two seats here, and can you just move back for now? Are you, you're not in this panel. Yeah, I am. Oh, am I moving this one? No. Oh, I crossed out the <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so you two sit there, and then this is good. <laughs> no, wait, and we're missing one. Now we can begin. Okay, so this is the uh, refugee experience, and we will start uh, with Olivia. And before we get started, I just want to say I know that break was short, but we're going to have two more sessions, and then we have the world's longest break, <laughs> which will be starting at 5:30. We are going to have a, a, a photo, um, so don't run away after the second session. But we're going to go straight from cu cultural identity to migrants across the globe. Okay, so cultural identity. No, you should. Hello. All right, hello everyone. My name is Olivia Watson, and I am the student fellow from Kent State University. This summer, I traveled to Slovenia for my grant, and I reported on the SNAP elections that happened in May. Well, I entered the field hoping to interview political actors and get some juicy gossip and you know take some pictures. What I discovered focused my attention in an entirely different direction, from the radicalization from all political parties to the lack of unbiased media the government was more fragile than I expected and the people could not agree on a clear vision for their future. So, whenever I tell people that I was going to Slovenia, one of the very first questions that I get is, what is Slovenia? <laughs> so most people only associate Slovenia as the home of Melania Trump, which yes, that's true, and yes, that's important, but one person, you know, there's a little more to a country than one person. So. Slovenia has two million people, and there are 2.5 million speakers of the Slovenian language across the world. It is a parliamentary republic, and they actually have 95 political parties for their two million people. It was ruled by the Habsburgs of Austria for most of their history, and then they were a part of Yugoslavia. They became an independent country in 1991, and they joined the European Union in 2004. They didn't adopt the Euro as their currency until 2006. So, what is going on there right now? So, last year, the Prime Minister, Miro Sarar, faced potential impeachment because of a re refugee situation. So there was a refugee that came to Slovenia, and he uh, got a job, he started learning the Slovenian language, he was doing everything that he was supposed to be doing, but the government found out that he didn't go to Slovenia first, so therefore he couldn't seek asylum there. Well, the prime minister found out about this, and he goes, well, this guy, he's doing everything right, he's contributing to our society, we're gonna let him stay. Well, the public was not fond of that answer, and so they moved to impeach the prime minister. Fast forward through a lot of political drama, he got to keep his job. But then in May of this year, there was an annulment on a referendum on a railway that he believed to be the next step of development in the country. So, the Prime Minister decided to step down. Now, if you believe the media and everything that the media says, they will tell you that the reason that the Prime Minister stepped down was because of this railroad. But in fact, if you talk to political analysts or academics or pretty much anyone else in the country, they will say that it's because he was experiencing too much pressure from the unions. Now, last year, he raised all the doctor's salaries by 20%. And of course, all the other industries in the country wanted to raise too. So there was a lot of strikes and a lot of people were just angry and they wanted more money. So he stepped down. But the funny thing is, after he stepped down, he realized he wanted his job back. <laughs> so he decided to run again, but it gets better. So he had two top competitors. Remember I said there's 95 political parties, so there are a lot of people running. But the two top competitors were Marjan Sarek and Yanis Yanta. So Marjan Sarek was a former comedian, and his best and most famous acts were making fun of other politicians. 
He became a mayor of a small town a couple years ago, and this was his party's first time running for parliament. The other guy, Yanis Yansa, was um, a very controversial man in Slovenia. So he used to be um, the prime minister for two different terms, and he was a very, very left-wing guy. But this time he was running, and he's as conservative as can be on the right. And so he is very controversial because he was accused of accepting a lot of illegal funding from Hungary, and he never actually went to jail because they couldn't prove whether or not he accepted the money and how much it was. So the country was very divided on this guy, whether or not they thought he was a criminal or whether or not, or not they thought he was fit to be the next prime minister. <coughs> so fast forwarding through the elections, the controversial hero actually won, Yanis Yansa. Well, there was a record low voter turnout for this election. So there, like I said, there are two million people in the country. There were 1.7 million eligible voters. Only 900,000 voted. And of that 900,000, about 12,000 of the votes were just protest votes. So people either um, circled all the names on the ballot or they wrote in like a cartoon character or something. So along with the protesting, um, the s people in Slovenia are very peaceful people. Um, they had a stabbing like seven years ago and they say they're still shaken up about it. Um, so they use art to protest in the city. And so I chose this one because um, it's in English. It says the second coming of Karl Marx. But after the elections, um, art like this started popping up all over the city. And people were using it as a way to protest. So there were messages like that. There were messages like the people don't need a party or um, why vote, nothing changes anyway. Things like that. So moving on. This election showed us two main things about the current political situation in Slovenia. One is that most of the political parties are extremely radical now. And two, there is no free media. So starting with the radicalization of the political parties, there are no moderate or pragmatic parties anymore, it seems like. Everyone either <coughs> wants to close the borders or they want to cut all taxes and leave the European Union. So to illustrate this, the radical right guy that won Yanis Yansa, I talked to one of his supporters, and here's a quote that I got from her. I asked, why did you vote for Yanis Yansa? And this is what she said. I heard they want to bring a mosque to Ljubljana. People can believe whatever they want. I don't care, but don't bring it here. This is Slovenia. So I found that very shocking. And you can see how radical that the parties are right now. So moving into the media, the radicalization of these political parties has moved into the media because the, the political parties are the ones that are controlling the media. So there is really no free media in Slovenia. There's three national newspapers, two TV stations, and all of them are funded by either the right or the left. So, so, um, um, because of this, there is, um, sorry, space thing. <laughs> I'm very jet lagged, my apologies. So, um, this is the reason that Yanis Yansa actually won the election, political analysts say, is because the media kept attacking um, Yanis Yansa, and so they saw him as the vic victim. And so the public actually kind of felt bad for them, and they were like, oh, you know what, he can't be that bad we're gonna vote for him. At least that's what a lot of people I talked to said. And so this, like I said, was back in May and June. This is now October. Yanis Yanisa was not able to form a coalition, and now the comedian is in charge, <laughs> as of a couple weeks ago. So now that he is in charge, that he needs to form a coalition, and there are plenty of issues that are going on right now that he needs to take care of. One is the unions going on strike. That still needs to be taken care of. Two is the border between Slovenia and Croatia because a town like this, Peron, Slovenia, is right on the border. So Slovenia only has 46 kilometers of coastline and Croatia wants it. And so they're still fighting between those. So now it's the job of the new prime minister to establish the borders. And third is to fix the media situation. So that is all I have time for right now. Thank you, Pulitzer Project, for making this happen. And I look forward to your questions. So 
Lavini also has a really good basketball team. <laughs> right here is right good? All right, so just, um, I'm sure you're tired of me introducing myself, but I'll do it again anyway. <laughs> so I'm Jonathan Custodio uh, from LaGuardia Community College, and my presentation is about Afro-representation in Mexico. Yes, black people in Mexico, who would have thought? Um, so what is this project about? So in 2015, Mexico had a census, and for the first time in its history, people in the country were allowed to identify as black. And when I first heard that, I was just shocked. Like, I couldn't believe it. Um, how did it take so long? So I wanted to do some investigations on that, and I should mention I have not gone to Mexico yet. Should have been the first thing I said. Uh, this is still pre-reporting. And you know what's really fascinating about it to me is to really find out what are the policies that the government is instituting to better support these people. Prior to the census, many felt that they were invisible. Are they quote unquote visible now? Or do they feel that way? How do non-Mexicans see Afro-Mexicans? How do they see themselves? Um, you know, three years is not that much of a long time in order to see you know, a lot of progress, but it's still great to see you know, what is sort of happening and how it's transpiring. And in terms of cultural identity and uh, black visibility, you know, there are a couple of issues with the census because it asks uh, people in Mexico are, do you have Afro-descendancy or do you classify as Afro-Mexican? But there are many terms that people use in Mexico to identify as black, but are not necessarily those specific terms. So they, just using that question, they estimated that there are 1.4 million people who are black in Mexico. Um, but because there are so many other terms that people identify themselves as, that number could actually be a lot larger, um, a lot higher. And in terms of like what it means to be Afro-Mexican, uh, there is something called Afro-Mestizo, which means that you're mixed with African blood. And for them, this is really, uh, you know, there's so many nuances involved because, you know, you have ties to indigenous peoples and you have ties to African blood and, you know, you're not really sure what you want to identify with. And there, there's so much a strong support, at least more so for indigenous peoples, that people tend to sort of stray towards that a little more. And I can identify that with very much because I'm Afro-Dominican and growing up, I was also, I was often told that black and Dominican were separate. Um, yeah. Oh, this guy is uh, Vicente Guerrero. So he was the country's first and only black president. Uh, it was after the Mexican Revolution in the early 19th century. And he actually uh, led uh, one of the main armies for the revolution. It was called uh, Ejército, um, Ejército Moreno, which means dark army. And I thought that was funny. It's kind of like Lord of the Rings, if anyone's ever seen the movie. But yeah, a little different. So who will my audience be? Um, this is gonna be guided towards uh, the Latin diaspora, obviously people who are in Mexico, duh, and people who are unfamiliar with black representation outside of the US and in the US. You know, This ties into the idea of pre-associations. I feel like when we think of a certain country, immediately it pops to our head about what people look like from that country. And I really wanna challenge that with this project. You know, That's why you know, movies like Coco, great movie, I loved it, I cried at the end. But, you know, it's not a to it may not be a total representation of what people look like in Mexico or how people culturally identify themselves. So that's really what I want to tackle here. And the Mexico Latin and Latino diaspora is something that's, uh, there's a slow growing movement in Latin American community of more black identity and more black visibility. So I also want to tie into that a little more. Uh, why should anyone care? The popular question. So obviously, discrimination in Mexico. This is something that you want to investigate further uh, on a moral ground and also on an economic ground. One of the things that the census points out is the illiteracy rates and the access to education between uh, Afro Mexicans and Mexicans, and it doesn't create much of a contrast. It's only about two percent difference, but there are numerous studies that indicate otherwise. So that's something that I want to investigate on the ground and firsthand. And this idea of I'm still not totally sure if that's the right way to phrase it, but black possessiveness or divisiveness in the United States, and this is something that I've dealt with personally where there are black people in the United States who want to create this singular ideology of what it means to be black. And that's something that I want to challenge. You know, When I was growing up, like I said before, it was that I wasn't black enough or I wasn't Dominican enough and I had to choose one side. And I was, you know, as I got older, 
I just mix it together. And that's something that I really want to question. You know, I've been told it's just people from Africa or black people in the United States. And obviously that's not true. There's black people all around the world. And I just want this to be another example of that. And like I said, the Afrocentric movements in Latin America, something I definitely want to tie it into. Uh, so timeline locations, uh, I will be leaving in December, late December. And the reason for that is, even though it's still not completely decided, but there are, I really want to celebrate, not celebrate, but watch how they celebrate Three Kings Day and see if there's any differences with the rest of the country, if there's any specific things that they do. Uh, music and dance is a very big part of the Afro-Mexican culture, and I want to see if there's any distinct variations there. Uh, I plan to spend three weeks in Veracruz and one week in Mexico City. Mexico City is where I'll be speaking with many of the governmental agencies, but Veracruz is where I'll do many of the on-the-ground on uh, reporting. So if you look at uh, the middle of the map, you'll see 031. I don't know if you can see, it's not that large, but uh, the town is called Carillo Puerto, and it has the uh, highest population of Afro-Mexicans in Veracruz, and it's one of the places where I intend to go to. Every, every uh, town here is a candidate. I might go to all of them. I might go to a few. I'm still not sure, but um, I'm really looking forward to investigating about what these towns differ, how they have to operate. And the reason why I chose Veracruz specifically is because historically, it's where many uh, African people were dropped off. Uh, it was a port city. If people were ever at war with Mexico, that was the first city they were going to go to. If you were going to land in Mexico, that was the first city you were going to go to. Oftentimes, when slaves were dropped off in New Orleans, they would go to Veracruz right afterwards. Now, it does not have the highest percentage of Afro-Mexicans, but out of all the stories that I've read, there has not been any coverage of Veracruz, like pretty much at all. Most of it has focused on uh, southern states in Mexico, Guerrero and Oaxaca, which do have a high uh, black population. But Veracruz is right there with them, and I believe they deserve that same amount of coverage. Uh, in terms of how I'll go about it, I'm thinking just to do audio and print. You know, I was also thinking about uh, expanding it to video. You know, complete multimedia. But I'm open to suggestions because people have advised me that they can all take away from each other. So um, I plan to produce it in English and Spanish. Uh, these are some of the NGOs, the government institutions. The one to look out for is called Mexico Negro. Uh, they were instrumental in forcing the government's hand to do the census. And lastly, these are just some of the uh, media outlets that I will pitch to. Um, the list is a lot longer on my, in my notebook, but um, I'm not going to put all of them. Uh, the ones that really stand out are uh, NPR is Latino USA, which is a very popular program on NPR. If you guys ever heard of it, it's wonderful. Uh, it ties into you know people of color in the United States, and uh, Aldea News, which is a Mexican publication, and it's not one of the many well-known Mexican publications, but it's one of the few independent Mexican publications. And if you guys aren't aware, Mexico has a huge problem with consolidation in journalism, so I wanted to stray away from that. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Hello. My name is Abigail Bacal. I go to Guilford College. I'm a senior in St. Greensboro. Um, and this summer, I went to Ethiopia and reported on adoption. So why I picked this project? Um, well, I was inspired by my friend Pravina. She was a Pulitzer Fellow. And um, I knew when I saw her presentation that I wanted to be like her and uh, do a project. Um, why Ethiopia? Well, my family's from Ethiopia, so I really wanted to go home and um, see where my family's from and do some sort of project. Um, and so when I thought of that, I went to my teacher, Cheryl, and um, we thought of a project to do. I first wanted to do education and girls and how that looks in Ethiopia, but um, during the time that I was going, everything would be closed, so I wouldn't find anything. So then we decided to do adoption. Um, so I read about the new law, and I like got interested right away. And um, so what pretty much happened is they, fa uh, they banned all foreign adoption, so no one um, without an Ethiopian passport can adopt from Ethiopia. Um, and so I wanted to find out like what will happen to the children that are currently living in the orphanages. Um, my first initial thought would be 
they would just be kicked out and all the orphanages would be closed since there's nowhere really that they can go. Um, but that wasn't the case. And so, yeah, I've always wanted to travel to Ethiopia. And um, one of the things that I really struggled with was not having a bias while reporting because I just wanted to report all the good that Ethiopia brings out because um, that's what I see. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Um, I needed to tell myself every day, like, you're gonna see bad things. You're gonna like hear about like things that aren't good with the country. You just have to report it. Um, and I really love the experience. So I'm really grateful for um, the Pulitzer Center and everyone that gave me this opportunity because it was definitely unforgettable and amazing. Um, and I enjoy working with kids. So that was like one of the things that like kind of sparked my interest. So a little bit about the like law. Um, so this just happened in January. They set the law in January. Um, and so the reason why that they said it, well, what I was told, um, was that there were many people that were, uh, or many children that were being abused and or killed by their adopted parents. Um, now, that's not the case with all families. Um, these were just like the small amount of like cases that were reported. So when Ethiopia heard those cases, they kind of freaked out and was like, why are we sending our kids to another country to just be killed and like abused when they could just stay here and like know who they are and like know their identity and like know their culture and be safe. Um, so like I said, that's not the case for all families. I interviewed a family from San Diego um, and they adopted, I'm pretty sure, four kids um, from Ethiopia and they were looking to adopt another one this year but they couldn't because of the ban. Um, and they were pretty upset about it because uh, they, they think in their eyes that they're doing a good job with their family, and which I agree with, they are. Um, they have a good sense of like their um, upbringing with the Ethiopian culture. They have a lot of Ethiopian friends that they immerse their kids in, so that was one thing that I thought was interesting, how they um, definitely put their children in the culture and made sure they know who they are and like where their background is from. Um, so like I said before, like Ethiopia wanted uh, their children to be protected. Um, and so like when I first heard this, I thought all the orphanages were gonna be closed. Um, that wasn't the case. What I learned was there were more children's homes in Ethiopia that don't allow adoptions than there were um, orphanages that do allow adoption. So that was one of the things that, um, the options that I really like researched. So this was one of the um, orphanages I visited. Uh, this is called Kinanamara Children's Home. It's located in Addis Ababa, which is the capital. Um, and these, this was the only orphanage I went to that allowed adoption. Um, now they can't because of the ban. But um, this was the hardest orphanage I thought was like trying to get the information from because I was told one thing. So like example that happened, I was out taking photos of the kids and then all of a sudden someone comes running and tells me that I can't take photos when five minutes later, or five minutes earlier, I was told that I could. Um, so there was very like harsh rules on like no videoing, no nothing, you can only take photos. I couldn't get any of their names of the kids. Um, I couldn't really ask them any questions either. I could just kind of observe and like kind of see what they're doing. Um, and one of the things that I thought was interesting too, there were all volunteers from the US and the UK that were volunteering at the uh, orphanage. And so I kind of talked to them and they were kind of like on like a mission trip just to like go around Ethiopia and like just helping out and volunteering. Um, and one of the guys that I interviewed, he was adopted from Ethiopia. He's in college now, he's a senior. Um, and so he was coming back and to helping out with his friend because his friend was teaching. And he personally did not like the law because um, he was obviously brought up in a good home and he thinks that there are a lot of kids that could have that opportunity because if he st would have stayed in Ethiopia, he definitely wouldn't have gone to school and he was saying how like he wouldn't have had the opportunities that he does now. So he um, thought the government wasn't really thinking when they were um, making that law. So that was kind of interesting because I got to see someone that was adopted and then that came back and kind of helped out with um, with an orphanage. This was another orphan's home. Um, it's called Hanna's Orphan's Home. It was an orphanage. 
Um, so this was one of the ones that you weren't allowed to adopt from. So pretty much this was called like a children's home. So what they do is, is they um, find children that have been affected, um, like their parents have, been, have died from AIDS or HIV. And so they take them in and they give them a place to stay. They make sure they um, go to school. And over the summer, well I visited over their summer or winter, so they didn't have school. So they had trainings and they prepared them for the school year. And so um, pretty much what they do is they also give them like life lessons on like what they need to expect um, when they are 18 and they can't stay in the orphanage anymore. So they prepare them on what's next, whether they wanna go to university or college or find a job. Um, so they help them through that and they pretty much uh, teach them and train them on what to expect, what they need to do. Um, they make sure they're ready. And they pretty much like, I don't know, one thing I really noticed was like, there's such a great sense of community. Um, like everyone is coming from the, kind of like the same situation. And um, they find like families within like the orphanage. <coughs> um, so this was um, another one that I went to in Gondor, Ethiopia. It's located in the north of the country. Um, and so see, these are some of the kids that I took pictures of. Um, so this was uh, run by a woman named Nagisti Gerusalase and it's been running for 40 years. She started off when she was in 10th grade and she pretty much like scrapped around for money. She was trying to find resources, anything that she could to start up this orphanage home for uh, these children. And now it's like very successful. They have um, six homes in Gondor, three for girls, three for boys. And in each house, there are 18 uh, children living there. Um, and in the house, they have a house mother and a house father. And so what that means is like they have like a mother figure, mother father. And so um, they help take care of the children. They make sure they go to school. They give them chores. Um, they teach them how to cook and all that stuff. And so I really liked reporting. This was very short. It was cut short because I had to leave the city because of problems that happened. Um, there was a riot that came up. And so I had to get out, sadly. Um, so my record reporting got cut short. Um, these are kids from the daycare. I was gonna go back and spend a, another couple days with the kids at the daycare, um, but I couldn't. Uh, but they have that for single mothers. So like single mothers go to work and they don't have anywhere to leave their children. So they can come drop their kids off uh, at the school, at the daycare, and they're taught um, and they have like free time as well. And so their moms go to work and then they come back and pick up their kids. Um, and not only do they have like an uh, orphanage and children's home, they have different trainings for s single mothers, which I thought was really unique. And so they teach them how to uh, feed their children and take care of their children, um, which was interesting. Ooh, okay, I'm running out of time. Which is interesting because um, they don't just focus on kids that don't have families. They focus on kids with single mothers as well, um, so they can help them. And so. Uh, they really try and promote to care for their children instead of like begging for money um, to like do that. I just want to show this slide. Um, this is just kind of like what I saw throughout my trip. Um, these are just the people of Ethiopia. Um, I think it's a beautiful country, personally. I do have a bias, but um, yeah, so I definitely thought it was really a great experience and um, I just kind of wanted to show like the people. Um, but yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Holly Pippenberg. I'm from Southern Illinois University. Um, I want to start by saying that I did this project with Brian Munoz, who couldn't be here today. But um, we did separate but together projects. He did a photo essay, and I did a short documentary. But um, our story is pretty much the same. We use different sound bites slash quotes. But um, it's the same story, which is about identity. Um, no, it's OK. <laughs> Um, so I just made kind of like a video slideshow of clips. Um, to start out, this is Mission South Dakota. Um, technically though, it could be known as Mission Rosebud Indian Reservation. Um, it's quite like many other small towns. Um, it has, I don't know if this is playing, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go, okay. 
Um, it's quite like many other small towns. Um, I actually saw many similarities to where I grew up. Um, it's a fairly close-knit community, um, but there are challenges that come from, obviously, it being a reservation. Um, it's about a 20 by 60 square mile um, reservation. It was established around 1868, 150 <coughs> years ago, with the Fort Laramie Treaty, um, and that is pretty important. It's an important thing to note because that's where a lot of the laws come from that are now under question um, and are being challenged, as you may have you know, guessed, um, nearly every day. Um, in this town, though, Mission, on the reservation, um, the biggest town there, um, there's a university, as you can see here. Um, it's Sinti Gleshka University, named after Spotted Tail, one of the Lakota Sioux leaders. Um, this university has been a model for many other native universities in the nation. Um, and it has just under 1,000 students, which is pretty impressive. Um, has programs such as nursing, education, science, um, and even a Lakota studies program, um, so people can learn the native language. But it's interesting, you know, you have all these resources. Um, a lot of times, um, students who go here get to go for free because of the assistance they get. Um, it's worth noting that over 98% of all the students K through 12 in the school district are under the poverty line. Um, so not only do they get assistance, but the programs are specifically tailored for them. But with all the students that could come here, it begs the question, why don't they? And it really has to come back to a much earlier beginning in education. Um, graduation rates aren't the best, 55% um, of students in the district graduate. Um, and that also comes back to attendance rates, um, only 37% attendance rates. Um, and a lot of people, you know, as you hear a lot, like to blame the government um, and the funding issues. But interestingly, most schools in the nation receive 8% of their funding from federal government. Um, and Todd County School District receives 53% of their funding. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, the taxes in the area can't support um, the school district and the state hasn't been really good about working um, since it's technically national government jurisdiction and not necessarily state government jurisdiction um, but a lot of the educators we talked to actually which kind of gets into the issue of identity didn't think that this funding is necessarily the big problem um, it's kind of about how it's funded um, to elaborate Historically, education has never been in favor of native populations. Um, it's kind of a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to education. So um, take the standards that you may have grown up with, um, SAT, ACT, getting ready for that, or you know, Stanford tests when you got into fifth grade. Um, they're using all of that for these students who really haven't been prepared for that. And on top of that, um, there is definitely a generational divide. So if you go back two generations, um, it's the boarding schools were what controlled these reservations. Um, and a lot of the grandparents were told not to keep learning their language, um, to really conform to what American education was. They then passed down to the next generation, the X generation. Um, so now the parents of these children have been told by their parents not to pursue this education, basically, because it's not as rigid anymore, but it still kind of has that um, idea of not being for them. Um, I, I talked with someone now who's a student achievement fellow at a middle school um, who said he remembers in second grade, he went to South Elementary School, remembers the teacher's name, remembers the students in the class. Um, one day, the teacher announced that they were gonna be learning about Native Americans. He was so excited. He went home, opened up his book, big textbook, and there were four pages, um, two pictures. One of them was a map of all the reservations in the country. The other picture was of a man with a bridge cloth and a scalp block, and it said, Savage Indian. So, you know, you can, you can have the people around you help shape your identity, um, but if the, your education is not supporting your identity and helping you form a positive image of yourself, then what, what do you believe? Because aren't you supposed to be learning that? Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Um, and communities are trying to combat that. Um, 
that where we went, there was a Sipchongo youth program, um, which was fairly new. This summer we went, it was actually the first time they had um, started events. They had block parties and stuff um, for kids to come out, trying to get them out of the house and really reinvigorate that sense of identity. They had a few elders come for a drum circle so they can teach students about this. But then again, there's always this question of, should we teach this? Are people going to accept this? Because we've been taught for so long that this language, this way of living is not okay, and it's still being reinforced into schools. Um, a few grants, national grants, have helped to um, fund native learning um, in education. There's three that were given to the school district, um, quite a few thousand dollars, but they're only implemented for three, for three years. Um, so teachers have the chance to incorporate curriculum to their classrooms, which does help. Um, things like quilt making, beading, um, language studies, and a lot of the teachers are students from the last generation who are helping to make a difference in sometimes their children's lives because they want them to be interested in school. Um, so it's, it's a lot of people are trying, but how do you really enforce that idea again when you don't have the government there to support it? Not necessarily the money again, but just the content. Um, and I think taking this project to a bigger level, um, one of the things we came across is, you know, and people mentioned, everyone should know their identity. Um, and we, we wondered, you know, in issues in like other minority communities where attendance rates and graduation rates are low, is it because that curriculum is also not suited well? I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have read things in textbooks that maybe kind of skirted around the issue or didn't really touch on what they wanted to hear or something. So, and then on top of that, um, there's been quite a few issues in the media lately. Um, Dakota Access Pipeline, voter IDs in North Dakota, um, a few cases about Native American property rights made it on the Supreme Court docket last term. Um, but they're either unheard of or they're touched on for a moment and then moved away. And one reason we pursued this project is because we thought it was really um, compelling that we technically do have other countries inside our borders, um, but we rarely focus on them. And we wondered if these larger issues or the issues that have been more popular in the media could be traced back to the issue of identity. Um, and I wanna leave with a final thing, which was a word of advice that um, a teacher gave to us and for her students, um, which was, she said that if the students don't learn now, they're not gonna wanna learn about treaty rights. They're not gonna wanna learn about voting rights and they're gonna keep losing the land they live on. MD persecution in Pakistan, and over the course of the presentation, we'll explain who the MD Muslims are, what their persecution entails, and our reporting in Rabba. So just to start off, since we're a group of three, I figured we'd introduce ourselves. And my name is Isla, and I'm a third year student at Northwestern in Qatar. I'll just use my own microphone. Um, so excuse the shakiness, we're over caffeinated and excited to be here. Um, <laughs> My name is Isabel Palma, Northwestern University in Qatar. Uh, I'm originally from Honduras, um, moved to South Korea after that, then to Qatar, and now I'm here, so. Um, my name is Amna, I'm originally Qatari. I'm kind of a Qatari-Indian hybrid. I'm a graduate of Northwestern University in Qatar. And um, yeah, that's about it. So there's about roughly half a million MBs in Pakistan. They're a persecuted minority, and they're a minority sect of Islam. So there's about 350,000 to 500,000 estimated, and they're not only singled out in the, their passports, but also the Pakistani constitution. There's a second amendment um, saying that and these are non-Muslims, and they are subject to imprisonment for posing as Muslims. And that can technically be anything from like saying the Islamic greeting of Assalamu Alaikum or the Kalama, which is the testimony of faith. And 
On top of their multifaceted experience of persecution, there's also in the thousands violence and attacks against them. So because of that, they qualify for asylum in countries like England, Canada, US, so many have fled, but the remainder that are left in Pakistan, usually as they face persecution in other towns, they go to a remote village called Rava, which is the only and the majority town in the country. So the reason that it's the only and the majority town in the country is because after the partition, the community had the land leased already to be their headquarters since Muslims had to divide into the newfound Pakistan region. But uh, the name Rava is mentioned in the Quran and these people are not allowed to pose as Muslims according to the constitution. So without any of the consent of the residents, the name was changed to Janab Nagar, which just means um, town alongside the river. And there's also a first information report launched against all the citizens of Rava because simply being in the means that they are in contravention of the law. And yeah. so basically, and the Muslims, um, what makes them different from other Muslims is the fact that they believe that their founder, Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of the 19th century, is a prophet after Muhammad, and other Muslims believe that Muhammad is the final prophet. So for that reason, there's a doctrinal apostasy, and they're considered heretics or gophers, deniers of the faith. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, so it's an extremely politicized issue uh, in recent elections. So we got there and unfortunately and fortunately, it was election time. Uh, so we arrived in the Lahore airport and there were thousands, I mean not thousands, but tens of hundreds. Well, that's an exaggeration too. Um, of cameras around, um, around the airport. So they were just expecting something to happen. It was an extremely heated political time in Pakistan. Um, so Imran Khan, who's pictured, um, he was kind of, well, he was elected as a president and uh, prime minister in uh, Pakistan. And then he is attempting to kind of like bring up progress in Pakistan. So he appointed Atif Mia, um, a really, really um, prominent Ahmadi member and after that a lot of clerics came out and he started this they started saying like oh like how how dare you um appoint this member of the fnd community uh this goes against pakistan this goes against everything um that we believe in and so unfortunately for atif mian he had to be removed and just proves that uh you know that there's an extreme uh, persecution in pakistan um and the clerics are extremely powerful and the issue is that in Pakistan, Ahmadis can't vote. So for a political agenda, it's not really convenient for them to kind of promote the Ahmadi kind of rhetoric and kind of Ahmadi belief uh, because they're gonna get no votes out of it. So for them, it's just you know a lose-lose situation if they promote an Ahmadi member in kind of like their, their, their uh, political agenda, then it would be kind of detrimental to their whole uh, election process so I can skip that um, so we got there and we were two weeks in Pakistan we interviewed both victims and officials of the Ahmadi community um, it was a very emotional time because we were going around Rava and it was extremely difficult to just sit with people and hear their testimonies um, it was extremely, extremely emotional for us because we didn't know what to expect when we first got there. There were a lot of misconceptions, a lot of uh, things that we didn't quite uh, know how to approach because of the sensitivity of the topic in Pakistan. Uh, people kind of uh, shared how you know family members got shot, how they got uh, ostracized, how they were just simply outed from the society. Um, so we kind of adapted to the cultural sensitivity in that sense. Um, because it was really, really hard for these people to come out and talk about it. Um, we could not disclose purpose of the trip due to the hostility against jour journalists and, and Ahmadis in Pakistan. So we couldn't even say anything when we were in Pakistan. We couldn't really mention what we were doing in Pakistan. Um, so as a Honduran, I've never 
I mean, I've never been in Pakistan before, and it was extremely, extremely um, kind of nerve-wracking to just get there and not know what to expect when we were at the airport. And then uh, the securities were just checking around, looking at our equipment, and seeing like, oh, what are you, what are you guys doing here? Like, they were asking a lot of questions that we didn't know how to answer. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, nervousness that went around just arriving in the airport and seeing all the cameras hearing about the explosions that had happened before uh, in cities like Ghetta. Um, so there was a lot of expectation, a lot of nervousness around just being in Pakistan in of itself. And then coming to uh, the people and seeing what had happened to them and kind of wanting to make the best out of the trip and want to properly represent the stories and the lives of these people who obviously don't have a voice. Um, so just statistics that we wanted to include. Uh, 765 people um, kind of booked for the Kalima, 477 for posing as Muslims, as Ayla was explaining, 379 uh, assaulted and 260 killed for, the, for just simply um, stating that they're Ahmadi Muslims. Um, okay, so we're kind of running out of time, but um, as a lot of people here spoke about, when you're uh, doing your research and your pre-reporting, you kind of don't know how it's going to be when you're actually in the field. And a lot of people mentioned that things were different. So we originally, our, pro our idea for this project was to report on Rabba being a safe haven for um, AMD Muslims and uh, being a safe haven where they could relocate to, where they could live, live out their peaceful lives. But when um, when they actually got there and we, we actually like spoke to them, it was quite the opposite. Um, people were tired of their situation. They felt like they were sitting ducks. They didn't have a purpose. They weren't part of normal, uh, normal communities. Like my partner said, they were ostracized in normal communities. So when they relocated there, they didn't really have a purpose in their lives. And they didn't want to leave, but they didn't want to stay either. So they were kind of like in this state of like purgatory and like in betweenness. And um, I think we kind of like messed up there. Um, but uh, yeah, basically they couldn't even, while they were in Rabba, they thought that they would be able to practice freely. But even there, they had to be very careful about um, how they practiced and how they um, even went to their like religious mosques and their religious sites. And we actually came out of this with um, a video, which we sent out. But we're also going to show it now, a little clip. काफी रह गया ये कादियां नहीं हैं इन्होंने तो हीन किया ये उस रह गया वो उस रह गया मैंने कोई ऐसा इशू नहीं है ऐसा जरूर यही है कि ये ये कादियां नहीं हैं और बस तो हमारे कहाँ साहब ने तो दुकानों पे लिखा हुआ उन्होंने कि मज़ेनियों का ताहला मज़ूम है क्या तब आज ये कि तेरा पता चल गया वाले तो कि मर्जियों का दाखला मैंने कार्यान्यों का दाखला मैंने और ये वाजबुल कतर हैं इनको चीज देने वाला इनसे लेने वाला वो सब गुनागार हैं इनको चीज देना हराम है So yeah, we just want to reiterate that even though Rabba exists as a hub for AMD Muslims, they're still not safe either there or in Pakistan. So these are just some testimonies from people that we talked to. And this image is um, actually of like um, a riot or a talk that was held against AMD Muslims. And it actually, um, things like these take place very often and sometimes like religious clerics will actually bring these kinds of gatherings into Rabba itself. So even then in their own communities, um, and these aren't really safe and they aren't validated even then. So we just want to thank the Pulitzer Center and um, everyone who helped make this project possible.
Meg from University of Missouri. I have a question for Jonathan. Um, when I was in Mexico, me and my translator had just a few conversations about like colorism issues. Do you expect that to be a big issue or like a big theme in your project? Definitely. Um, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Does it work? Am I just not turning it off? Definitely. Gotta press the on button. Sorry about that. So, I mean, racism, is, I mean, I'm sorry, colorism is something that's even, uh, there's a lot of research that shows it's, it dates further back than even racism because racism is a, a, a social construct. So I definitely expect to see that in my research and I, I would be kind of surprised if I didn't, but I hope I don't, but it happens. want to say quickly to you that I have a thought for an outlet which is in the thick which is part of Latino um, Futuro group and I'm good friends with the lady who runs it with Maria Inajosa so I'm gonna connect you with her uh, today that, that <laughs> I, I definitely uh, appreciate it but I, I also start an internship with the Futuro Media Excellent. group on Monday <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi there, I'm back again. I'm Jared from Blackler College. We've more gone over that. Um, I had a question uh, for you. Don't mean to add another question onto you, but um, what sort of, from your pre-reporting and what you've seen, um, what are some of the more corrosive and harmful effects of being excluded from a national narrative? So if you're an Afro-Mexican, what are the harmful effects of you know people saying, well, you're either black or you're Mexican, you can't be both? Uh, I'm getting so tired of the Jared, but no, I'm just kidding. Uh, your well, your story is you know your story is forgotten, and you're at risk uh, to be not included into what people see as basic rights or basic human rights. You know, one of those examples that I saw or accounts where people were being deported or had to prove that they were black, even though they were born and raised in Mexico. There were people who had to name the governors of like five states. There are people who had to recite the national anthem multiple times. So if your story is not being told, you know, what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna be left out of everything that other people are entitled to. Is that a good answer? Liz, I'm Columbia University. This is for Abigail. Um, it seems like it's a really incredible reporting trip. I'm wondering if in your reporting you came across other countries that are thinking about following Ethiopia's example or if there's, I don't know, government meetings surrounding that. Um, yeah, I did. I can't remember which one. It was either Liberia or Libya or something. Um, they're also, I think they're the only ones in Africa that are still allowing foreign adoption. So Ethiopia was um, one of the last two. And so I think after they closed, I think that there are other countries that are going to follow just because of, um, like, like I said, like the trauma and the abuse that the kids are going through. Um, so I definitely do want to look into that more. But I think what I did find was Ethiopia was one of those people that um, was still adopting, but they were hesitant to stop, but then they eventually stopped, so. Hi, I'm Joy, and I'm with Spelman College. I'm Ina, Isla, and Isabella. When you were reporting, um, could you please talk about how, I assume like y'all like lived with people in, um, in the community. How do they live day to day? Um, where do they buy food? Like, how was it hard to come by um, accessing food and things like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a remote village, but like, oddly enough, since there's nothing to do, I know other people have done uh, journalistic stories about this in Rava. Um, they're very into interior design and like architecture. So the house we stayed at was uh, actually my extended family's and it was super modern. And when Isabella came, she was like, wow, this is better than a hotel. So in terms of like accommodation, um, we were very comfortable. But that being said, like there's a lot of uh, mental health effects of the residents just because they're just stuck in their house. Like as pretty as it is, 
they can't leave. And like even the women and children that we interviewed, they said one of the main things after moving to Rava was that they can't go out to pray or they can't do, um, they can't meet in congregation with like other Muslims because after all the violent attacks, the community has a mandate that women and children um, just shouldn't uh, add to numbers or else like they're very likely to have an attack if, and these are all in one place. So um, I just think in general like Rava is, just kind of a place that people end up reluctantly and in that sense it's isolated, but that's my perspective. I think Isabella, who had never been there before, can add it. I think I was actually surprised because when I got there I thought, okay, like people are just gonna like, not, like Isla said, like sit depressed, but then there's kind of like a hope that people have. Um, they want to move forward, they want to do work um, in our documentary. There's a couple who lost uh, their two daughters and they kind of like complain about just sitting down. Like they don't wanna just be, you know, doing nothing. They wanna move out. They wanna, you know, be able to go to groceries, go do like normal activities, but it's just unsafe for them. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, there are mental health um, consequences. Um, yeah, I, th I think we covered most of what we saw. Yeah, and what, um you said about like just going out and being part of society like to keep in mind like how ostracized these people are is that the women they have this like very distinct hijab style that like Isabella noticed when she landed um and because of that like when store owners recognize it they refuse them service so they have trouble buying things and then when it comes to having a job the minute your employer finds out you're Andy you're done for and then I think just that adding up like really discourages people from like calling Pakistan a home or feeling at home even if all their neighbors are in the and also um, sorry um, it was actually kind of you know I was really really nervous getting there because there were a lot of explosions there were a lot of attacks that were happening because of the elections so just imagine like adding everything everything political that's going on to their already like very dire situation so just adding that kind of like layering and that advantage that polit politicians take on uh, people slandering on Ahmadis, like it's just, it adds to the situation and there's, there's like an addition of layers and layers and layers of issues that they have to deal with, so. about the Lakota because of, uh, we talked a little bit about this, but uh, I'd like to ask you about overcoming the uh, distrust issue. And also, what is their relationship with the society surrounding them? Are they, do they really feel subjected to uh, a fair amount of uh, racism? Um, yeah, um, the, the first, the trust issue. Um, so Interestingly, I know a lot of people have talked about the longer you're there, the more trust you build. It was actually the opposite um, for me. Um, a little background, Diane Sawyer did a piece on the reservation in the mid-2000s, and apparently it was not done super well. Um, I watched it, and the people did not receive it well, so they're very distrusting of journalists um, coming in and talking to them, and especially their children, um, because it was a project on education. So the longer Brian and I were there, um, actually, we, we came in with a few sources. We started talking to them. They were OK. The superintendent actually spoke with us, um, and he was fine with us. But um, the longer we were there, parents started realizing what we were doing, and there was backlash. And the superintendent pulled back and said, you are not allowed to talk to children anymore. Um, so it, it, was, it was very interesting. There's still, I mean, understandably, that level of distrust um, and I, I mean, I hope it gets better. Um, to your second question, it is not a great relationship. Um, I actually stayed in Nebraska, just like right below the border, um, because there weren't many options for um, lodging anywhere else. And um, just going out to eat at restaurants um, and stuff like that, which is something we did to try and get more information about the area, um, people were very, <laughs> very rude. Um, and something that's been happening fairly recently in the last 10 years is actually the the rules on um, tribal government aren't super strict. So you have people from in the state, maybe in an outside county coming in and actually running for election on the reservation somehow. Um, so it, it's, it's very strange. The dynamic there is very, it's, it's, a, it's a definite power struggle. 
Yes, for the most part. Sometimes they can try and prove something. Um, it's, but again, there's not much paperwork to back that up. So thank okay. you. Thank you. OK, I think we're going to wrap this up. Um, I did want to end with one question building on the theme of trust. And that is what uh, each one of you would recommend to the student fellows who are still going to go out into the field on how to build trust. And Jonathan, why don't you just say what your plan is in building trust? And just like a 30 second answer. We'll start with Abigail. Um, one thing that I did was when I first went to the orphanages before starting to report, I kind of just went and just hung out with the kids and hung out with the staff um, just so they can know who I am and like know my face um, and just know that like I'm not here to harm anyone. Um, and another thing that really helped too is getting in touch before I left. So I talked to Nagusti over the phone a couple times and um, like emailed her back and forth and like made sure she knew exactly what I was doing, um, being open with where it was going and uh, what will happen. And yeah, that's about it. Um, I think what I've seen in this project and in other projects as well that I've that I've uh, worked on is I think it really helps to spend time with the subjects or to be in contact with them before beforehand and um, uh, one of our panelists this morning uh, said the same thing of like um, it helps to talk about things other than the actual thing you're reporting on to actually build like a connection to see if for the other person like your subject or um, the community to see that you're actually a human being too. You have interests that connect you to them as well, other than what you're uh, covering in the face. Um, in my case, I asked Isla for a hijab. So everyone in the community was wearing a hijab and I kind of, kind of not only wanted to be part of the community, but I wanted them to see me and see that I respected what they believed in. Um, and I also think that I like sat down and listened a lot. I not only like spoke and try to impose like my like ideas of who they were, but I let them speak to me and they and tell me what they were going through instead of like me coming down and telling them like, okay, this is what I have read about you guys. This is what I like come here to report. I just sat down and let them kind of like open up to me and you know that awareness uh, of the of the sensitivity of the topic too. I feel like is important. Um, so I think one of my partners mentioned the couple that lost their two children. Basically their house was burnt down for them being ambient. Their like three-year-old and six-year-old daughters were suffocated and died. And we really like felt that was a compelling story to include in the narrative about Amdi's. But the thing with that is calling them in for an interview, <coughs> given, them, given that we don't know them personally, uh, they knew that they were coming to say the story for that particular reason. But we wanted them to say, um, transparently and narratively opposed to just factually reiterating uh, the sequence of events. So I think when it comes to our line of questioning, we didn't start off with like, hey, like how did your daughters die? We asked things like, so what was your daughter's laugh like? And they kind of built upon that and really like told us what happened. So I got lucky because um, everyone was pretty eager to share their political opinion. Um, but they really appreciated being open and transparent about where the information was going, and they just wanted to make sure that they were being represented in the best light. Uh, the popular practice I keep hearing throughout this uh, whole session, all the sessions today, is to embed yourself uh, with the communities that you're covering, and to ensure that you prove to them how dedicated you are to tell their story and to tell it as fairly and accurately as it deserves to be told. So, you know, that's whatever, well, not whatever it takes, but mostly what it takes to prove to them that, you know, that's all I'm there for. I'm not taking a stance. I'm just, I'm just there to tell your story like uh, you were saying earlier. And in addition to adhering to any religious or social customs that might offend people and, you know, being as respectful as I can. Yeah, I kind of already talked about this a little bit, but um, I found that um, especially doing what we're doing, kind of digging around, um, official sources are great to have, but they're not always the easiest to get in contact with. So just like everyone said, getting involved with the community, going to events, looking at flyers, um, and stuff like that, and taking advantage of if people invite you to go to something, go to something.